Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. My name is Alan Johnson. I'm head of public programs here in the museum, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to the first uh, behind the scene of our winter and spring season 2014. Behind the scene is a program series that we've done. We're entering now our third season, uh, and it's a really fun one because it gives you, the audience, uh, an unprecedented glimpse into the wonderful projects that our conservation team here at the museum undertake. It gives you not only a look behind the scenes into what happens behind closed doors here in the museum, but it also gives you a really interesting look behind what you see in the galleries. And that's why we kind of give it that clever title, Behind the Scene, S-E-E-N. Um, before I turn it over to Paul Benson tonight, who's going to give our presentation, I just wanted to mention a few of the upcoming behind the scene. If you, if you enjoy tonight's event, you will undoubtedly enjoy these upcoming ones. Uh, the next one will be on Friday, February 28th, when senior paintings conservator Scott Hefley will talk about the conservation of uh, not only Caravaggio and St. John the Baptist in the world, and this one of our great things, but several of the works in our Baroque galleries. Unfortunately, from what I understand, that, that talk is sold out. It's a, we have very limited space in our galleries, but if you're really keen on coming, I might just risk coming that night to see if we have any no-show space available. Sometimes that happens. Uh, I do know that we have plenty of space still in our Friday, March 21st, behind the scene, which will feature objects conservators Joe Rogers and Alicia Halligan, who will talk about maintaining all of the works of art in the sculpture park. In the Donald J. Hall Sculpture Park, we're going to be celebrating its 25th anniversary this year, so that's going to be a really fun behind the scenes look into those works. And the series concludes on Friday, April 25th, when the newest member of our conservation team, Sayara Lewis, our photography conservator will talk about all of the intricacies of preserving daguerreotypes. This is kind of in preparation for an exhibition that is soon to open in the looking glass, recent daguerreotype acquisitions. So a great, wonderful lineup. But tonight, of course, we get to hear all about the work of art that you see here. And hopefully many of you have seen down in the galleries as part of the exhibition, Echoes, Islamic Art, and Contemporary Artists. It's a work, uh, as Paul, I am sure, will explain, has been in the collection for a very long time, but has not been on view for quite some time. And Paul's uh, talk this evening will go into all the intricacies about what it took to get it ready to put it back on view. So please join me in welcoming Objects Conservator Paul Vincent. Good evening. Uh, for those of you who really want to go to the behind the scenes uh, with Scott Hefley in the galleries, I think Adam could be uh, could find a ticket for you for a very small price. <laughs> from what I understand, he, he's been known to do that. So don't, don't worry about there not being space. Well, tonight we are going to talk about this spandrel. It's also called an arch. And, uh, this came from the Grand Bazaar in Isfahan, Iran. Uh, which was completed around the year 1600. Uh, we don't have any way of dating this one uh, specifically, but it's approximately from the year 1600. But there's a couple things we really need to talk about before we really get into this, and that's what this is. It's called faience, but this is also a faience. This is Egyptian faience, and they're two very different things. Egyptian faience looks a lot like uh, the color of the, uh, the spandrel, which you'll see, but this is actually the Egyptian faience is not ceramic. It's actually almost glass. And it's made in a completely different way. Uh, the faience arch or the spandrel that we're seeing is actually ceramic. It's a glazed ceramic. This is glass. It's self-glazing. Uh, they're two different things. The one that we're going to be looking at is actually it's called faience. It's named after the city in Italy, Faenza, because this is where the technique was really developed around the year 1299, somewhere in there. So don't, let's not get these two things mixed up. Also, uh, what we don't want to get mixed up is the appearance of this piece nowadays. As you can see in the top, we got the crescent appearance. Uh, all the places where you see the yellow, down below, uh, actually tried with Photoshop after many, many attempts to make that gold because we did find traces of gilding on that yellow area. 
So if you can imagine that, that arch over a doorway shining in the midi sun, and, uh, hitting that gilt surface, this must have been spectacular. So we do know that it was gilded at one time. We don't know if that's original or something <coughs> added at a later time, but uh, they say it probably was spectacular. This is the only picture we have of this actually in place. Uh, in this day, some time before 1984, the piece was installed around 1934. We don't even have the exact date for that. But it came into the collection in 1933. Uh, there's a lot of very interesting correspondence in the file about this. Uh, and you start looking at all the copies of the Western uh, Union Telegraph. Uh, was, this came on a, on a ship, the Ile de France, left from Ile, from uh, Lille, France. It was purchased in France from a dealer who was going bankrupt, so we got it out of steel. I mean, it was just dirt cheap because this guy was going bankrupt. Unfortunately, it took so long to get here that the payment was delayed. The man did go bankrupt. Uh, our purchasing agent over there actually had to loan the poor man some money to get by until our check showed up. And because he loaned him all of his money, our agent didn't have enough money to go to England for a business trip, and he had to borrow money from somebody else. So uh, back in the, the 30s, the, the money didn't instantly travel around the world like it does these days. So uh, it, it does have an interesting story. And part of the problem when it got here, some of the pieces were from a different arch. So that didn't help much either. So there was a delay in finally getting the right pieces together. But we finally did. And this is the way it looked up until 1984. If you look through that doorway, maybe you'll recognize the wood from the, the one of our Indian galleries give you an idea of where this piece was actually located. Here's a picture of it actually as a, after it came off the wall. The piece was actually mortared right directly into the wall. It was plastered into it, uh, so it made it, it was permanent. It couldn't be moved. You had to have masons then to move this thing. The way the piece is made is actually very interesting also. You can see why they didn't, really didn't want to move it very often. It's made from a, from a glazed ceramic, which is laid face down on a table of some type. All little different colored pieces are fit together, kind of like a mosaic. You have probably a cartoon laying down on the table. Then you pour plaster over the back of it. And these pieces, since they don't fit tight together, all the pieces are outlined in a little bit of white. So it really makes this thing pop, too. So it, it's a very interesting piece. But it's also, with all that plaster, it makes things very heavy. And that was part of the problem with this. Uh, if it wasn't heavy enough to start with, I'm going to show you some weights on these things. Uh, when it got here, the masons decided to add even more plaster onto it to put it in the wall. And as you can see there, they just used uh, blobs of plaster and copper wire to put it on the wall. It actually stuck out in a little way, so it, didn't, it wasn't flush with the wall. Uh, that's so that they could actually paint around it uh, in a rather haphazardly fashion and they weren't real careful about where the paint went uh, over the years, uh, which was one of the things we had to clean off. But this is really how it was installed. I think it's kind of fun to see these old pictures. Uh, you don't see these very often about how things were done that many years ago. Well, this is what it looks like. Uh, what looks like the pink on here is actually the original plaster. And it's only pink because it's been painted in the gallery. And otherwise, it would be white, and you wouldn't know the difference between the original and the white mortar, the white plaster, which is what's been added since then. And that little wire-looking thing right there, that actually is copper wire. Uh, that's one of the techniques for holding things onto the wall. These pieces were actually wired together, so they made it even more difficult to take off. This was something that uh, we wouldn't attack ourselves. This was probably done by masons who came in to do this. And uh, from now on, we won't have to worry about that. This is kind of a side view of it, again, showing you the original depth right here. And this is all of this. It's all new plaster which has been added onto it to strengthen it. Now, how it survived all those years uh, without being strengthened, I don't know, but uh, it did. And this is just to give you an idea of how thin that glazed surface really is. It, it is remarkably thin, but, but it is really quite strong. And the reason why that uh, say each piece is cut individually, I mean, it would be easy just to make a great big piece of ceramic and glaze it, 
put it in the, in the furnace you know, and then let them do it that way. But each one of these colors that they use actually attains its best color at different temperatures. So if you did this all at once, it, well, maybe your blues would be fantastic, but maybe the greens wouldn't be quite so green or the blacks wouldn't be so black. So each one had to be done separately at a different temperature and then put together. And that's what really makes these things spectacular. And this is just a, again, a close up showing you how, uh, how thin that is. And this is the back of it, uh, showing us what the Masons did here. Uh, all that is new plaster. Some of the pieces are reinforced with Excelsior. Some of them are and some of them aren't. Uh, there's actually a different quality in the plaster from piece to piece. I think they had apprentices working on the job here. They would mix up enough for one panel that somebody would mix up plaster for another panel. Sometimes they forgot to put the reinforcing in. Sometimes they put a lot in, sometimes none, sometimes just right. So there's all different kind of qualities on this, which was very apparent when it came time to take this off. Now, I guess the question is, why did we want to take this off? Well, these things were extremely heavy, and they were very difficult to move around. If we wanted to install this someplace else, we would have had to get masons to come in again and put it in the wall for us. Well, we wanted to avoid that. So we had to find a new way of mounting this so it could be moved around easier. And uh, that's what we're talking about here tonight. This gives an idea of what it looked like when it came out of the box after almost 30 years. Uh, it, I mean, un unfortunately, these pictures don't really do them justice because they were absolutely filthy. Uh, there was paint splatters around the edges. Uh, there were paint splatters in the middle. Uh, I don't know how all that paint got on there, but uh, I guess over the course of 50 or 60 years, uh, we have 50 years that it was installed. Uh, the gallery was repainted several times, and uh, you, you get what you pay for sometimes. So when you say in the box, <coughs> what sort of box do you store these in? Uh, each, decades? each one had its own crate. Uh, it was oh. a flat crate, and then each one went in individually. Each one was blocked so that it wouldn't move inside the crate. And then the crates were just stacked on top of each other. The bottom one was on wheels. Then the other crates just fit on top, so each one was stacked about four high. So uh, it made it easy to move around that way. And were they like temperature controlled? Or? Yes, everything in the museum is temperature controlled. All of our storage is that way. So I guess it can, even though it's all temperature controlled, it's in a sealed crate. It got absolutely filthy. And, uh, and who knows how maybe it came out of the wall that way. Maybe. It was, they were doing it so fast they didn't have a chance to clean it up when they took it down. But we continued on anyway. Well, our, one of the first steps was actually making sure that all the pieces were secure in the bedding. And if anything happened, if any of the pieces came loose during the process, we wanted to make sure we knew where they came from. So we decided to put tissue paper over the front of the entire piece. So this is a what strength tissue paper, and this is just a tissue paper, paper laying there. And it was put on with an acrylic adhesive, and here I am just uh, putting the, the adhesive on. And the advantage of this is that instead of getting that kind of that opaque look with the tissue paper on, once you have the acrylic on there, you can actually see through it. So if you see any damage, if you see any pieces starting to fall off, you can immediately recognize it and know to, to be a little more careful with this. So this actually worked very nicely. The tissue is quite strong. The adhesive is reversible in either water or acetone, whichever one you wanted to, to use on it, depending on the circumstances. And that's basically the last thing we did was take off this adhesive. After everything was all done, you take it off, clean it all up, and it's ready to go. This is the tool that we decided to use to take the plaster off. Uh, that was the question, how do you get through all that plaster? Well, a hammer and chisel would have worked, but that would have put a lot of vibration into it. And when you're taking off two inches of plaster with a hammer and chisel, uh, that can take quite a while and be pretty messy. But we use this tool, and this is it if you want to come up and look at it later. You've seen these on television. This, this blade just oscillates back and forth like this. So we thought this would put in very little vibration into the panels. It probably wouldn't create a lot of dust because there's not a lot of movement here. It's got very nice teeth on it, so it should eat into the plaster very well. And it actually worked very nicely. The only problem was it only worked for about 15 minutes before we had to change out the blade. 
and we went through about 300 of these blades on this. Uh, we spent a lot of time changing out blades. As far as dust went, when the blades were new, there was virtually zero dust. You could actually put your nose right down here and you couldn't get a bit of dust. But as the teeth wore down, it got dustier and dustier and dustier. And you'll see some pictures here of uh, the dust created on this. Uh, there was so much dust, we actually burned up two of these. Uh, they were under warranty. Uh, <laughs> they gave us a new one the first time around, and that lasted a little while. Then they gave us another one and said, uh, don't come back again. <laughs> so they said, you're doing what this thing is not supposed to do. This is supposed to be for a wood, probably primarily in ceramic tile, uh, not for going through, you know, seemed like miles of plaster. So that, uh, that was nice of them to give us some new ones. And uh, uh, luckily, it's still working right now. Well, the first step was, and when you're getting it turned over, which uh, isn't easy on some of these, making sure that uh, nothing happens to them, then trying to decide how much plaster to take off. Well, I decided to leave on one inch of plaster on this, so it's upside down, the face is on the bottom, and what I did was took a one inch thick board and laid it on the table, then just drew a line around the top of it, around all four sides, and that's where we cut in. So if you can imagine this thing laying in front of you, this thing wanted to start going in this far at a time, as deep as a blade would go. And by having that line on there and having this pretty flat on the bottom, you could actually keep it pretty flat. You, could, you weren't going up and down a lot, so it was fairly controllable. It wasn't perfect, but it was really good enough. So that was the first step, just establishing where we want to cut. And here I am cutting away on this thing. Um, so you can see the spray booth back here, our filters uh, have gotten a little bit dusty, so it, it, they all had to be replaced at the end of this project. And here I have an intern, uh, suckered her into this one. <laughs> That's what interns are for. This just shows the process a little closer up, and there she is, you know, cutting underneath. Then she cuts down from on top of it, and then you remove that piece, so it's coming out one chunk at a time. So it's a fairly slow process, as you can imagine. Uh, there's a lot of vibration going on in your hand. There's not so much in the piece, but there's a lot of vibration in your hand. So it's not something you could really do all day long. And here's one piece uh, part way through. You can see how thick that plaster is. That's, that's coming off of there. So it, uh, it is going to lighten up tremendously. And how do we know when you removed enough? All right, well, this is what we used. Again, we put that same one inch board on either side of the piece, then laid a metal straight edge across the top of it. And as you slid the straight edge along, if it hit the plaster, just draw a little circle with the pencil, I know you had to take off a little more plaster. So if you didn't touch anything, that meant you had enough off, had enough off of it, go on to the next one. So it's a, it was pretty straightforward. Again, it didn't have to be perfectly smooth and level. That really didn't make any difference because of what we were going to do later on. So this, uh, again, this was a process which had to be repeated several times on each one of them to make sure that enough plaster really did come off. <coughs> and here's what these things actually weigh. Now you look at the total weight uh, in this column. Before we started, weighed over 1,100 pounds. And after we finished, only 477 pounds. So that's all that, all that was plaster that came off. That's over 600 pounds of plaster off of this thing. And the next column is the, the total weight after you put the mounting boards on, which we're, we're going to see in a few minutes. So if some of these pieces went down from, uh, say, from 170 pounds down to 78, which made them much more manageable. They are now easier to move around. Two people can handle them. It's much safer. If you had to go up high with these things, there was less danger of taking something up so high in the air. So we think this really was a, an, an advantage to doing this. And it also made it uh, easier to make it a temporary installation. We didn't have to hire masons who knew how to work with plaster to move this or install it for us. Our art handlers could do that, and again, we'll show how it's installed in a few minutes. What did you do with the plaster that came off? I threw it away. I mean, can it be recycled? Um, I don't know. I just threw it oh. away. <laughs> I suppose you could recycle it somehow, but uh, we didn't. Uh, we didn't recycle all the blades, though, I will say that. So, 
I think we got a buck fifty out of that. We took them down uh, about three hundred blades. But it's a thought that counts. Well, now that we've got some of the plaster off, we need to start thinking about the backing board, how we're going to mount these. So each individual piece was placed on a piece of paper. An outline, the exact outline was drawn off. That's what this outer line is. And then trying to figure out a way to put an inner line. This is going to represent the backing board, this part in here. So it had pretty straight lines. So we wanted to make sure that it went inside the outline so it was actually recessed a little bit. So when you looked at it, you didn't see the mounting board. And that was really important that when you looked at it straight on, you weren't going to see anything. So this is what we did for each one of these pieces. We sent it to a manufacturer in Minnesota who made these for us. And this is what a honeycomb panel looks like. Uh, it's aluminum on the outside, it has an aluminum skin, and honeycomb on the inside, it's all aluminum. I've got some samples here. This is one which is actually, got, it has a paper facing, but it does have the aluminum inside of it. And it all has this basswood outer edge on it so that you don't see all of the honey from it. It would be very pretty looking at that. So they put an outer edging on it. And on all of ours, we actually had added a two inch strip of poplar right through the middle. I actually told them where to put it on each one of these so we could actually mount the bracket onto this. That's always the question, well, how do you mount that? Well, that's what it is. We actually screw right into this that we're screwing into wood. This is actually the one with aluminum. If you want to come up and look at these later, that's fine. I didn't have one that was finished, but this is really what the aluminum one looks like. And it's, it's very strong, it's extremely strong, it's lightweight, it's very flat, it's predictable. Uh, each one is exactly the same as the other, so it is actually quite an advantage to use these. We use these a lot also in uh, textiles, for mounting textiles. And, um, so that's actually quite light, and if you remember right, if you went, those of you that went to my last Behind the scenes, you remember the shuttlecocks are also made out of honeycomb material. So we get a lot of use out of this. All right, well, now that we've got the, the, all the plaster is off, we've got all of our backing board shaped. How do you mount these things? How are we going to put the, each one of those Fayance panels onto that? Well, we had to do some uh, mock ups, we had to make a test. Um, whatever, had, whatever method we were going to use had to be reversible, it had to be strong, it had to be strong in shear because these things were on the wall and the weight was just going to come straight down. If they fell off the wall, they weren't going to fall forward, they were going to come straight down. So we needed an adhesive which was very strong in that particular uh, that specification and we used an epoxy. Well, this is some of the mock-up tests that we used. Uh, took the aluminum panels just like you saw here cast some plaster to represent the faience, and it's in the exact same thickness, and then glued it onto the panel with the epoxy, and did an official U.S. government strength test. <laughs> uh, well, maybe the government, I don't know what government did this, but uh, I don't think it was ours. But it's kind of part of what you see here. This is a vise. The aluminum panel is stuck in the vise. This is the plaster which represents our faience panel glued to it, using paint buckets with a strap across the top to represent a pulling force straight down. I wanted to see how much weight it took before we could actually pull that plaster off of the panel. And everything else in here is just to prevent uh, the paint crashing to the floor, to prevent, if this does let loose, it's not gonna fall down and smash on the floor, so the rest of it's just safety. And every 24 hours, I added more weight onto it. Just more weight and more weight, and finally it got up to over 60 pounds of weight, and it hadn't budged. So I figured that's, this is the adhesive. That's what we're going to use. Well then, okay, now we have the adhesive, but is it reversible? Everything we do in conservation has to be reversible. We would never put these panels on permanently. Uh, what happens if we made a mistake? If for some strange reason we got the panels mixed up, and put uh, honeycomb panel number eight on Fion's panel number 10. And we discovered that when we went to install them. Well, mistakes do happen, we didn't, but uh, it could, so we had to make sure we could actually take this off. So this was a test afterwards, after we figured out it was strong enough. We put the same thing into a closed box with some acetone, 
in here and sealed up this little container and just let the vapor, see if the vapors would soften up this epoxy. And sure enough, it, did. it took about 48 hours. So we did soften the epoxy. It could come right off so we know that if necessary, if there's ever any reason to do it, we can get these panels out. And this is our ultra high tech, ultra expensive epoxy gun, which I have here. This particular epoxy can only be applied, of course, with a $300 gun, of course. But this is what it is. It's a little spout that goes on there. And there's two cans in here. And as you pull the trigger, it mixes. There's a little spiral inside here. And these two mix together. When it comes out the end, you have perfectly mixed epoxy. It's actually, it's actually very nice, but you can only use this type of epoxy in this gun. And that's what you have to do sometimes. And once, now the way I did this, again, the panel, the Fayance panel was face down. We're working on the back. Instead of trying to put epoxy over the entire back of it, it would have cost a fortune. This, this epoxy is very high tech, very expensive. So what I did was just make blobs of it. I just went around and made blobs. Now, but first, before doing that, I wanted to make sure I get enough blob in one place because the panel, the Fayance panel, isn't absolutely flat. So if you put this much epoxy in this much of a hole and put the, pan, the aluminum on, it's not even going to touch it. So I did the same thing we did in making sure the back would have enough plaster off of it. I went around with that straight edge, and every place where there's more of a gap than about a quarter inch, I would draw a circle so I know to put a bigger blob there so that when the panel went on, it would smash down and spread out. So this whole thing is just covered with little blobs, probably three dozen blobs all over the place. The, the panel goes on, and it's all weighted down with sandbags, and uh, 24 hours later, it's done. So that, that part's pretty straightforward. Did you have to do this like inside like a spray booth or? Yes, it's all done in spray booth. Uh, the epoxy doesn't really have much of an odor, but just to be on the safe side, that's, that's what we did where we did it. So once that was over, we flipped everything over. Now it's time to take off the, the facing. This was a very, very long process that was much more difficult than I thought because the paper really bonded to all that white plaster goes around each one of the pieces. Because the glaze is virtually impervious, it didn't stick very well to that. But boy, did it stick to the plaster. And it took a long time to get that off. Uh, there was hours and hours on each one of those getting that off. Um, I learned my lesson on that one. And there it is. There's the finished piece. Uh, that, what you see on the back of that, this little bracket right here, this is how it's going to be held onto the wall. It's a two-part system. One piece is mounted to the wall. This piece is on the back of the panel. And it just lines together like that. And it allows some movement so you can get make sure things are adjusted right. If they're not perfectly level, you can put a little shim down in there and still get enough. It will adjust just enough and it'll raise up just enough to get things perfectly in level. And it's very simple, it doesn't bind up, it just comes right off. It's, it's a very simple system that's also very strong for our, this particular application. So, after that was done, each one of these pieces was hung on the wall on a piece of paper. And again, the outline was drawn on it. The, the location of the bracket on the back was marked on the template. We made a template for each one of the 10 individual pieces, then taped it all together, and laid it out on the floor to make sure everything was right. Put, the, put these pieces now on top to make sure everything lined up right. And that's how we use it to mark places on the wall. So there are all the brackets up on the wall ready to, be, to receive the pieces. Uh, that's always a question. I mean, how, do you, how do you know where to put these things? Well, that's it. You have to make a template. Again, a full size template. And it was only one little mistake. Yeah, that's why that one piece you saw was the bracket was at a slight little angle. It's because of, uh, that was the uh, missing piece, one of the missing pieces that came from France. Uh, we think there may have been something else that was missing with it because it wasn't quite right, but it matched up pretty well. So it, uh, 
We're not sure if that's the right piece or not, but it, but it worked. And this is how our installers uh, did this. We use a you know, piece of equipment called the Big Joe and lay each individual piece on this board and raise it up to the guys who are in this lift here. And then they, there they are receiving the piece. They just slide it off onto a board that they have up there at the top. And they lift it into place. And we started in the middle because uh, we're trying to figure out you know, really how, to, how do you mount this thing. Uh, it's always that last piece. How do you put that last piece in? And they finally figured out that there's only one way you could actually put the piece in and get your hands out at the same time. It's either that or leave a couple fingers behind uh, for the people who are deinstalling it so they can get their fingers in. Well, they didn't want to do that. Uh, it's union people. On the <laughs> but there they are, right now, starting in the front door and working their way out, working down. And finally, the last piece, uh, that last piece is that top corner. And there it is, that's where it was, in, where it was installed. Now, uh, where do you get your hands on this thing to get it up? You do have to lift these things. You saw the bracket, it has to be lifted up about an inch to clear the bracket. Well, right here in the middle, this, there's one piece that's about this big. I don't know if you can see the joints on it or not. We left that one just slightly bigger than all the rest of them, so that one piece can just be lifted straight up. And once that piece is gone, then you can manipulate all the rest of them. You have access to everything else. So that's you know, that something that they figured out uh, ahead of time. Luckily, I'm glad to say that they weren't have, don't have to worry about trying to figure this out later. But it's a very good it's a very good system. Uh, it allows us to move these things around as as we want to. It can be installed by us. Uh, hopefully we will get a permanent place for this uh, eventually. We don't know where yet, but uh, we do hope that everybody enjoys this. Now it hasn't been seen for almost 30 years. I don't know how many of you remember it from where it was. You do remember this? Were you wondering where it was all these years? This does happen with a lot of the art around the museum. That, when things do get de-installed, it does take a while for them to work their way back out. And a lot of times, uh, things do change in the intervening years, and this is one of them. And I think it's very successful. It looks very nice. Uh, unfortunately, we, we're not going to put the gilding back on it, because we don't know when that gilding was applied. If, we, if there was some type of records knowing that that was originally the gilding and looked like that, we could be persuaded, possibly, to do that. But since we don't know, we're not going to do it. We'll just and have it in the records that yes, it was guilt at one time. And that is it. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. When I purchased it in Paris, was it in the 10 pieces? Or was it in time? It was actually in nine pieces at that time. And it came in 10 pieces when they deinstalled it. Uh, one piece broke off. One of those points, the the one point uh, broke off, so that made it made it ten pieces. But it was originally nine. Nine. Pieces. Mm -hmm. Do we know how it originally got yeah. from Iran to Paris? No, we don't. We don't have any records on that, unfortunately. Uh, we had an agent in Europe who went around several different places and, and purchasing things, and he was very well known, particularly in Italy. But he did make an acquaintance of this man in France. <coughs> who was having falling on hard times. And then one of the letters he wrote to J.C. Nichols, actually, was telling him how great this piece was and you have to buy it. It's a bargain. He's going out of business. He's bankrupt. He's desperate. You have to buy this thing. There's nothing in Europe like this. There's virtually nothing in America like this. You have to have it. It's unique. And he did persuade J.C. Nichols then eventually to put the money up for it. And that's how he purchased it. Yes, sir. Where was it originally? It was in a bazaar in Isfahan, in, in Iran. You know which bazaar? It was called the Grand Bazaar. I don't know if there's if that still has a if there's still just one there. If there's a grand and maybe a not so grand one. <laughs> <laughs> that that the big one. But I I don't know if we know the exact building. Uh, the man who's uh, our agent over there, he said he did know where it came from. 
but I couldn't find it in the correspondence. He didn't actually name <coughs> which building it came from. He just, he just called it the Grand Bazaar. So, so where is the museum? Is this the stuff? It's in the block building. Just, uh, just go straight down the ramp and make a left-hand turn at, the, at where all the other Islamic things are, and you, you'll you walk right under it. And that was really, we, we were worried about that. Uh, if a piece of art is on the wall and it fell, chances are it's not going to hit anybody. But with people walking under it all the time, and it was a real concern, uh, should we put extra safety brackets on this thing? And we couldn't find a way to make them so unintrusive that it wouldn't detract from the piece. So we decided to go with this ultra high strength epoxy, and so far so good. Uh, I would just recommend walking fast when you do that. <laughs> just to be on the safe side. Paul, did you date the item? <clears throat> did you tell us when it was first made? This is, uh, the, the Grand Bazaar was completed in 1600, so this dates from approximately that time, I think. <coughs> yes, another question. Back here. So, how many hours start to finish? Man hours or people hours? Did you have that Oh, I would say they were probably at least 600. <coughs> yes, it was, it was a, taking the plaster off was a very, very long process. And you always had to have two people to help move this thing. But there was also a lot of um, you know, documentation going on. We had to photograph the front and the back. And of course, it always took two people to move these things around. So. Um, people in the lab knew when it was time to do this, so they would disappear. <laughs> and there were times when I literally just went out in the hallway and waited for somebody to come by and grab them and help me flip these, these things over. Because they, they are, they were very heavy. It's, it's not, 170 pounds doesn't sound like much, but they're so awkward and you have to be so careful about turning things. You can't put them on their edge or you would, you would crush the edge up. So whatever you did, you kind of had to turn it over and almost lay it down at the same time. So manipulating them was very difficult, but, but now it would be no problem at all. Yes? What period of time did it take? When, when, what day did you start and what day did you finish? This had to be installed uh, last year, I think in October. I think it's October of last year. And we started on it uh, more than a year before that. But, but we weren't working continuously on it. There were other things going on at the same time. So we did have to plan quite a ways ahead of time on this. Yes? You mentioned that the buyer said this is a unique piece for the United States. Is it still a unique piece in the United States? Are there other um, of these portals that you might see? There are other ones, but this is probably the most complete one. Uh, this is, a, is complete from, from end to end all the way. And that's, that's why he, he thought it was so unique, because it was absolutely complete. The only other complete one at that time was in uh, Germany. I forget where, but he said there's just one in, in all of Europe that's as complete as this. And that's why he thought we had to have it. Yes? process for prioritizing what works get referred? <coughs> well, it's, it's up to the curator uh, to decide know really what, what they want to put out. Uh, I mean, this piece was known. Uh, the curators obviously know what's in their collection. But they decided to say this, you know, this would make a very unique piece. Uh, we get it out, we look at it, we talk about it, uh, see what it's going to take to, to make it displayable. Uh, we have other pieces, uh, which you will see eventually, uh, <laughs> that have never been on display in the museum. And they've, been, they've been here since the 30s. And everybody thought they looked so bad that they, haven't, they had never been displayed. It was just one of those pieces that uh, we acquired. And all of a sudden now, we did a few tests on it, and it's not nearly as bad as people thought. And this, is, this isn't in that same category, but it was one of those things, you take it down, you don't have an Islamic gallery, we don't have that big of an Islamic collection. But now, all of a sudden, um, we have enough things, we borrowed a few things, we have a curator who is especially interested in Islamic art. So she decided, you know, what can she put out that the people in the visitors would appreciate that hadn't been seen for a while? And only one person in here has ever seen this before, so I, I think it was successful. Yes, sir. So when your manager says uh, 
How long is this going to take? What did you say? <laughs> Quite a bit less than six hundred dollars. Yeah. <laughs> but we we estimated the the cost on the buying the the oscillating thing here, and I I guess we probably would go through about a dozen blades on it. Uh, so that one was a little off on that, and uh, our departmental system was on eBay every other day trying to find these things, uh, buying them, you know. Yeah, at a bargain. I think they were, believe it or not, they're about four dollars and fifty cents each for those blades. And she was getting them in for three dollars sometimes, or she bought fifty at a time. So it's it's it was quite a bit more expensive than we thought. We got the honeycomb panel was that was that was a no-brainer. That was no problem. Didn't expect to have to buy the epoxy gun. That was another surprise. Uh, the epoxy was very expensive. That was a surprise. We didn't think it would cost that much. So that, there were a few things that we didn't count on. But, uh, I, I think it's worth the effort now. So it, it's something that we'll, you won't have to worry about again for a very long time. There are no more questions, I think. Oh, one more. It's just the, the plaster buildup that you removed, mm -hmm. what, was, that, uh, was that there when this piece was originally acquired? No, we think that was added, added here. as put on by the masons here just to make it stronger. You think of something you know, that weighed 170 pounds, but it was only an inch thick. They were probably worried about handling this piece, so they wanted to reinforce it on the back to make sure that it didn't break. And they were the ones who added all that plaster onto it. So it was probably their decision uh, based on their experience I mean, handling things like that. Yes? Did the ceramic tiles themselves we didn't have to do anything to them except clean them. Uh, that, was, that was the only thing we had to do. There were a few pieces which uh, came off during the deinstallation. There was some uh, plastic bag with little pieces, but they were all marked where they, what panel they went to. And that was the other intern's job, finding where on there that they went. <laughs> so uh, we made good use of it uh, pretty late. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And ladies and gentlemen, I just really encourage you to head down to our project space and take a look at, at all of Paul's great handiwork up in the stalls. <laughs>